The nearest analogy to MAP is the agreement that countries have, have made for interconnecting international telephone calls. It simply enables people to talk to one another and that's all. It doesn't solve the problem that they're all speaking in different languages. But MAP is a start and many manufacturers are adopting it to get better information flow throughout the factory, giving tighter controls and new ways of reducing costs. It's going to be a long time before most of the assembly jobs in a car factory are automated. But there are savings in getting the parts to the shop floor only when they're needed. So here, GM uses a controversial system called just-in-time. In the past, uh, we've had huge warehouses full of material. We've had stacker cranes full of material. Today, we try to, to uh, keep our processes in action with a minimum amount of material for a, a, an hour or a few hours of, of action in a particular process. Just in time means constant deliveries, with big penalties for any manufacturer who delivers late. This truck is delivering seats. Usually, they're unloaded by two robots. One uses a barcode reader to identify the seats and to unload them in the right order straight onto a conveyor right by the production line. But when MicroLive was in the factory, the robots broke down, producing a real dilemma for the engineers. With only a few seats left on the conveyor belts, there was a danger of the whole plant having to shut down. Repairs had to stop, and men with forklift trucks were called in to unload. The robots normally unload several times faster than these men, but machines are liable to break down. It's hard to see how MAP could have helped this situation. It's hard to make cars without seats. Automation clearly has its limitations, and often it's the flexibility of the men, not the machines, that saves the day. Yes, well, men can still do a lot of things that robots can't. But let's have a look at some of the new research into giving robots greater flexibility. Mike, let's start off with the grippers, the hands. What's new? Well, in our first video clip, we can see a robot hand that's been developed by Ken Salisbury, first at Stanford University in the United States and subsequently at MIT. A lot of flexibility there. It's <laughs> double-jointed, isn't it? Extraordinary flexibility. The hand was actually designed to be able to grasp an arbitrary object. It doesn't know anything about this can, but to be able to move it in a, any arbitrary direction and impress an arbitrary force on it. There was no attempt here to mimic uh, human hand design or human hand control. Is there any point in mimicking a human hand? Yes, indeed. As the uh, next video clip shows us, the, um, uh, if it were not for the uh, example of the dexterity of human hands, we may well have given up the task of trying to build robot hands with similar dexterity years ago. Here we see a system which has got four fingers. Uh, each one of those fingers has got four different uh, actions or joints, and each of those joints is pulled by two tendons, much like in a human hand. So there are 32 actions in all, unlike the sixth motion robot that we saw earlier in the program. And the motors are remote from the hand themselves? Yes, indeed. They're down that rather little marionette arrangement that you can see on the right of the picture there. Uh, why is it twiddling its fingers, Mike? Well, really, it's a demonstration to show just how fast a modern robot dexterous hand can go, because for a long time, people suspected that you'd never be able to build very fast hands like human hands. You'd always have to put up with very, very slow and rather cumbersome devices. Right, and it flicks it away very deftly. Now, those hands had no sensors in them, did they? They were just moving to uh, pr predetermined locations. Absolutely, and indeed, the, ad the attempt to incorporate sensory information, for example, to avoid collisions, as in this clip of film, which again comes from Stanford University in the work of uh, Osama Khatib, um, illustrates the incorporation of control into planning trajectories for a robot. The uh, kennel um, is being viewed from a TV camera above. Of course, the uh, system doesn't know anything about Snoopy or kennels or anything. It just, just recognises an obstacle. A black yes. blob, and it, if it's there, it'll navigate around it. If it's not, it'll go back to its preset path. Now, this system isn't um, restricted solely to visual information. Here you see force information being used to control the robot rather than vision. It's not, just, it's not <coughs> being pushed up, is it? It's responding to very delicate forces uh, as... Uh, delivered through a sponge which is being held by this operator here. And it's hardly being deformed, that sponge. It's hardly being deformed. This has got tremendous reactivity to external forces. What's all this handshaking about? Well, the basic idea is that uh, much of assembly and much of machining these days uh, consists of, as it were, bringing robots in graceful collisions with the external world, as, for example, in this scrubbing application or in here in following a contour. So we want to be able to program forces. 
Here's a rather different one, though, where uh, the work of Jim Trevelyan in Western Australia, uh, where we have a little sensor that appears to be simply flying at about an eighth of an inch above a human hand that's moving around. Why would you want to do that? Well, you... <laughs> the secret is in the uh, little end effector, though, which looks like a comb. Indeed, it's a cutter. This is a uh, robot for shearing sheep. Uh, and what it does is it goes in and it's uh, attempting to cut the wool. Yeah. Oh, the that's sheep. a real live sheep, isn't it? I saw it twitch. <laughs> It's a real life sheep, all right. <laughs> We're not going to see buckets of blood, are we? Uh, I doubt that you'll see buckets of blood. You actually probably can see one slight nick, but uh, you should understand that this system cuts a, cuts a sheep about one hundredth as often as a professional sheep shearer would. That's a, a moving, breathing sheep. Yeah, the key to doing this problem, in fact, is not only to have this sensor which is gliding over the surface of the sheep cutting, but to have a model, a, a kind of CAD model, geometric model of the sheep, which is used to plan paths, but where the sensor essentially adjusts its path to glide over That's the surface. A flexible the model. Indeed, yes. a flexible model. Now, all those robots we saw, including that one, were rooted to the spot. What's happening about robots moving around? Well, here you see an example of a walking robot, although wheeled and tracked uh, robots have also been built. This is a system that comes from the University of Tokyo. It's the first uh, robot that was unstable in the sense of falling over when you turn the uh, motors off but can stand upright when you turn the motors on. Now, hold on Mike, I've got a son who has a clockwork toy that seems to do exactly what we're seeing here. Right. Hold on Fred, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, the basic idea is that in your, in your child's toy, the centre of gravity of the system is deliberately pitched low so that it's stable and it won't fall over. Here, the state, and in particular in this one, which is the work of, the marvellous work of Mark Rabert, first of all at Carnegie Mellon and more recently at MIT in America, of uh, a system that's trying to balance it has a very high center of gravity and stopping on this thing falling leg. over yeah i wouldn't have thought that was possible no well nobody did actually until about five years ago so rabbit showed that you could in fact build a balancing machine why would you want a hopping robot well the idea of this system is that balance is central to ordinary human or uh, animal motion such as walking or running here you see a two-legged version of the same thing the it's actually two of those one-legged controllers that we saw in the previous video clip this thing is alternately being a left uh, hopping machine and a right hopping machine, and by switching between those two legs, you can gain the effect of running. It's detecting a tilt, and then it's responding to it, either by correcting it or by, in this case, it's, it's building on it. That's right. Uh, running, in a sense, is controlled uh, prevention of falling over, and it's shifting its center of gravity and adjusting its stride pattern accordingly. And by changing it in various ways, you can increase the speed of the robot. Here it's reaching somewhere between 12 Whoop. and 20 miles an hour. Took a tumble there. Indeed. This is a four-legged robot which is uh, built from the two-legged robot in pretty much the same way as the two-legged robot was built from the one-legged robot. Uh, you pair off um, couples of legs, here the uh, diagonally opposite legs, to provide one of the so-called gates of the mobile animal. If you ah. choose different pairs, you get trots or bounds or what have you. Have you taken these movements from nature? They, they, it does look as though it's been modelled on a, on a horse galloping or trotting. Well, actually, uh, engineering and uh, the studies of uh, human and animal motion are informing each other here. We didn't know very much about uh, human and animal motion until we started to build the engineering uh, device. I can start to see a use for a four-legged machine because uh, rough terrain would obviously need something that could adapt. As it moved. Indeed. The, the principal application of these kinds of walking machines is in fact to march off the uh, road and into forests uh, for lumbering, particularly in the Soviet Union and Canada. This research all looks very exciting, but what's next? How do you pull it all together? Well, what we've seen are a whole series of um, very exciting devices, uh, but what we really need to do now over the next few decades is to bring the kind of very intelligent controlling software that we get from artificial intelligence and use it to control some of these devices. Oh, good luck, Mike. Thanks very much. Well, that's about all for this week's Micro Live. By the way, if you were watching last week's programme, you may be interested to know that John Wilson won the User of the Year Award at the Rita Annual Dinner. Finally, if you think robotics have been taking two steps forward, as you'll see, it's also been falling over backwards. See you next week.